And uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to OTF Connects, Inquiry Across the Curriculum. I would like to thank each of you for joining us tonight and uh, giving of your own time to be here. I'm Sirius Skirham, facilitator and coordinator uh, for the OTF Professional Development Project. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome back Brenda Sherry and Peter Skillen. Um, Brenda and Peter have facilitated a number of uh, very effective webinars for OTF Connects over the last two years, and they've got a few that they will um, facilitate this this uh, year, and uh, this is their first. So, welcome, Brenda and Peter. Thank you so much, Syria. So um, I thought maybe we could just get started by introducing ourselves. So would you please uh, introduce yourselves in the chat, if you wouldn't mind, while we're um, getting started here. My name is Brenda Sherry, and I'm a technology coach with Upper Grand District School Board. So that means I work with the program department and help um, teachers who are interested in um, integrating some new technology into their classroom. Um, a lot of assistive technology is part of my job too, so inquiry is one of the big things that everybody's talking about. And I've done that for the past five years after being 20 years in the classroom with uh, primary, junior, and special ed were my placement. So that's me. Peter, will you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Peter Skillen. Um, I started teaching quite a while ago, 1970. Uh, teaching elementary, so I've taught uh, all elementary grades, and then I uh, was a computers and ed consultant um, guy in North York School District from about 1982 till 2000, and then I retired and uh, worked for a software company in Montreal, designing a cool piece of uh, actually software related to inquiry, and then. Um, once that was done, the YMCA started a secondary school, and uh, so I was one of the founding three teachers of that school, so I got it up and running. It's a school that serves kids who um, learn differently, just need a different kind of environment, and, and, and indeed need a project-based learning style environment. So I did that for eight years or so, and now I'm working, helping the YMCA uh, staff develop a a different culture of learning and way of uh, way of operating in this 21st century as staff members. Great, thank you so much. So thank you all for being here. It's great to see all the things coming up in the chat there. Um, people from all over the place. So that is amazing. I always am in awe of this kind of learning because we just can get connected and stay connected. So. That's amazing. Hi, Melissa. Good to see you here tonight. So we are hoping that this will be a conversation about inquiry. Um, and we invite you to use the mic as much as you would like to. We would really like to hear um, a lot of the things that you're doing in your classrooms and share ideas as much as um, some of the things that, that we're going to bring to you today. So please don't be shy about that. And, and if you are, we might be tapping you on the shoulder. So <laughs> we, we, we really want to have uh, some rich conversation. Um, one of the things that I, um, I've been noticing is people being kind of uh, confused about inquiry and wondering where to go. And you know, I think if you're not a little bit in confused about all the different kinds of inquiry we hear about, it, you, it's a little strange because it's not surprising that we're um, confused because there's just so many ways to call inquiry. Right, cognitive dissonance is a good thing. Um, so have a look at some of the, some of the kinds of um, inquiry we dug up as we were researching for this, uh, for this webinar. And um, I think one of the challenges that we always have in education is that as new documents um, or uh, publishers create new doc um, books and things, resources for us, they always try to put a new twist on it. And sometimes that means calling things by different names, which can be confusing. So have a look there. If anybody, um, the one that's difficult to see down at the bottom is called Coupled Inquiry. And that's one, I'm not sure you could give me a little check mark if any of you have tried coupled inquiry, but that's one I had to really look up in my research because 
it's a form of inquiry where you start in a structured way and then you um, make it more open-ended for kids. So I want to definitely learn about more about that one. I hadn't heard about it either, Melissa. So is there anything we're missing up there that you're calling inquiry or any that you're coming across? So take a minute to type some into the chat or um, grab the mic and let us know what resonates with you. All right, I'm going to move on there and we'll get talking about that later. I, I agree, Kathy, problem-based you often hear about for math. Also in medicine, I think McMaster University is quite um, famous for their approach to um, medical training and it's, it's in general what we might call problem-based. So I really started teaching at a great time, I think. It was the late 80s, so yep, I've been around quite a while. Um, I started in Toronto uh, and before I came out here to Guelph. But I think it was a great time because the focus was on activity, what we would call back then activity-based learning. So multiple intelligences theory was new, you know, brain-based research was starting to, to come out. We had huge involvement. I don't know if anybody remembers um, when we worked with Partners in Action, the Partners in Action document, where we would often work with our teacher librarians and um, and and work on uh, integrated units together. So we it was a great time, and we didn't have a lot of worry about curriculum like we do today. So I think I think today what we what we're doing is coming back to a focus on more student-centered learning, but we've got all that knowledge that we've already accumulated around assessment and curriculum content and that kind of thing. So I'm really excited that it is a good time. It's nice to see folks coming back to this. Um, what's interesting, though, is that I could spend a lot of time at, the, at back then thinking about what engaged kids. So I, I think that that was my prim, primary focus. My Most of my time was spent creating the environment that would really turn the kids on to learning things. And then we could go in a whole bunch of different directions. There was still a lot of content that was created by the boards, the school boards, but we didn't have um, the documents that we have today. So I think, I think we're in a better place that way. But um, maybe we're, we're coming back to that idea of how we're going to intrigue kids. How are we going to have that desire to learn? desire to know and, and that curiosity and activate that. Peter, do you want to tell a little story about how you came to inquiry-based learning? Sure. Um, well, like I said, I started teaching in 1970. So, you know, we just come through the 60s. That was obviously a huge revolution in uh, social conscience and so forth. And, you know, it was just a natural way of being in the world for us as educators at that time, particularly in elementary school, perhaps. Uh, so activity centers were the norm, and the, the theme approach, uh, absolutely trying to integrate, um, you know, so if an event was happening uh, somewhere in the world, let's say the Mount Everest expedition, and the kids were interested in, I was a climber, so I was interested, um, you know, or a kid brought in a, a frog one day, then you just started um, creating activities cross-curricularly related to that. We knew our curriculum. We knew what we wanted kids to learn because that was, you know, from the ministry in similar ways. The school districts, as Brenda reminded me yesterday when we were talking, actually developed their much of their own materials uh, on implementing stuff. Um, so it was very easy to to get materials to support the the student inquiry uh, at these various centers. The challenge uh, with all these things, of course, is to not make them just worksheets and rotate around from center to center sort of mindlessly. Um, but, but I do like to think of this whole notion as being as a way of being and uh, rather than a set of techniques or, or buzzwords uh, you know, and so forth. It's a challenge. And in 1978, then, I started with kids and computers. And honestly, there weren't any programs around then with, uh, with the computers. So, you know, we had a dumb terminal, actually. We hooked uh, up in my grade one class and ran a phone line to the library and had the kids start wondering what they could do with a few commands in basic language. And those kids would stand around that computer, these kids from a, a pretty rough little neighborhood, and uh, they would try things and they would be so excited about making mistakes and saying, well, what if I try this? What if I try this? And then when, when the success came, you know, their shoulders would raise, their their 
their heads would, you know, rise up and they'd be smiling. It was a social event. It was awesome. It was just uh, really cool. And then not not long after that, Logo came out uh, from MIT, from Seymour Papert and so forth. So everything was, was really just about, you know, checking out what you could do with things. It was very much a tinkering and exploring kind of world for us. So I was thrilled. That's And it stayed with me ever since. And, you know, I, I've watched the cycles over these years. Uh, and uh, my biggest fear is that inquiry will become a worksheet, so that we have to be cautious of, I think. Thank you very much. Um, so what we wanted to do today was kind of start with some of your questions about inquiry that you have right now. You've come to this uh, this webinar tonight. What is it you hope to get out? And we will keep track of those and, and hopefully address them as we move forward. So in the chat, let's just have a wondering about inquiry right now. What is it that you're thinking about? Um, what do you question all of the time when you're when you're trying this? Or maybe you're not you haven't tried it yet, so your questions are around implementation. Um, and then I'm going to share some of my questions and Peter will share some of his. So I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to do that, and let's just have two minutes, and I'll stop talking and put the timer on. Okay, thank you so much. I'm just going to capture those really quickly and throw them somewhere else. Okay. All right. Um, thank you for those questions, and I think we'll be able to address some of those, if not all of them. Um, it sounds like some of you are starting to dabble in this already, so that's really great. And um, it's interesting, Peter, when you mentioned um, the early years being play-based and, and why we don't have, why, why, um, how we'll manage that later on. We're starting to talk about this in my board. Um, the fact that a lot of our kindergarten programs right now are sort of Regio Amelia based or Regio Amelia based. So kids are, uh, teachers are basing the programs around play and around their questions and there's documentation boards and children are allowed big blocks of time to explore their interests and we're wondering what's going to happen when these learners hit grade one after being two years with this kind of a an approach, uh, we hope that we'll be seeing that continue through the primary grade. So that's that's one thing we're already thinking about. So one of the things, I, I sort of thought of a few questions that I'm always wondering about. And um, you know, some of, the, some of my questions had to do with what you folks were talking about. Is it really inquiry? So how much do I control the questions that we start with? Um, if I do control some of the questions that we start with, then is that really inquiry or not? And I don't, I don't really think that, you know, when, I, when teachers ask me to help them with inquiry, what's really hard is I can't sort of share how to do inquiry because um, there, there, it depends on the students, the teachers, the background, the subject area, that kind of thing. So that's one question I always really have. The other ones are around what elements do I have to think about when I'm planning because I think some people have this notion that inquiry means an unstructured process and I don't believe that that happens at all. It, there's really quite a bit of structure in it, quite a lot of structure, perhaps more planning and thinking and observing and documenting needs to go into this kind of uh, teaching than, than having a resource that you're going to do in a linear fashion. How do I make sure that everyone is learning? So if our focus is knowledge building, this is one of my biggest questions right now. And it's what excites me the most about having digital tools is how do we leverage the technology that we have to make sure that everyone is a part of the learning um, so that it's not just uh, certain students doing the learning and others watching or not participating. So that's another question. And then what kind of culture do I need to build in the classroom to ensure that inquiry will be successful? So 
what are the kinds of things in the background that have to happen around do kids know how to talk accountably together? Um, what are my routines going to be around um, working collaboratively or cooperatively? Do kids have a background with that kind, that kind of learning? So before we dive right in. Peter or anyone else, do you want to, um, any of those resonate with you in your, in your settings right now? Want to grab the mic and share? That would be great. I'll grab it while other folks are thinking there. But please, folks, uh, happy to have you involved with the discussion here. Um, I guess around the collaboration piece, people are talking about, Louise is talking about as well, and um, the technology. I mean, we have all these social tools, and kids are are great with the social, many kids are great with many of the social aspects of tools, um, but I'm not sure that they know how um, how to leverage those tools for deeper con cognitive collaboration. So that's been an interest of mine for a while, as some of you folks who know me uh, understand. Um, but the, the, those tools are there, so to build that culture and to have some scaffolding built in and to to look at some of the training, the tribes training, the various strategies that Kathy's mentioning there, and try and integrate those right into the technologies would be great. So whether you use Google Docs and uh, write some scaffolds in there um, would work. So you know, I've looked at this technology for a long time. I'm not sure we do leverage it to the best. We keep jumping to the new things, the new things, the new things, uh, surfing the surface. So, other folks, what do you? Do you want to grab the mic there? I'm just going to jump in, hopefully not, and uh, somebody else can go next. But, you know, um, when you're talking there, I w I'm thinking about one of the biggest challenges um, that we might face is giving up, being comfortable with giving up some control. Because when you do this kind of approach, you don't always know what the end is going to be. As much as we try to work backwards um, in our design, uh, there is that element of having to be responsive to students and see where it's going to go. So if you give up that control, I think what is really amazing is it, well, it's kind of twofold. One, you get so, many, so much in, engagement back from kids, I find, especially those kids who may not do so well in the traditional pen and paper, pencil kind of assessment. You, you, sometimes that really surprises you. However, on the flip side, you also get some kids, and, and sometimes it's the ones who have, have really figured out the game of school and are getting top marks in other subjects. Um, they sometimes get thrown for a loop, and they are, they are not really such big fans of inquiry at first. I don't know if anybody's ever had that, that experience, but we're seeing that in my, in my voice for sure. Anyone want to grab the mic and make a comment? Can you speak a little bit about what you said, Melissa? Hi, everyone. I apologize. I'm, I have an open mic today. I left my headphones with the microphone on it at work, and I apologize. Um, oh, it was just sort of when I was reflecting back on that idea of the teacher stance shifting. And I know in our board, we've had lots of conversations about adopting that inquiry disposition ourselves that we don't have to know it all, that we are the guide on the side. Um, but we do need to, and this has been some big learning for us, we do need to still have that end goal in mind. And what are the skills, the knowledge, the understandings, and the attitudes that we want our students to be able to demonstrate with some independence by the end of the inquiry, whatever length of time that might be. Um, so we still have that very clear goal that we're working towards, which is um, most often driven by the curriculum. But we also, in that disposition, acknowledge that the paths that we each take to that goal might meander and shift and change and look different from day to day. But we're still sort of always attempting to reach whatever that learning goal might be. Awesome. And Louise is mentioning starting with a big idea as well, helping you map that out backwards. Great comment. So I guess, you know, we can't really talk about inquiry without going back to John Dewey. And I always laugh when I hear about people saying that inquiry is new. And 
if only we could get what uh, get it straight from what he was suggesting we do in about 1918. Um, it's taken us a while, but here is one of my uh, my favorite quotes from him, and I just it strikes me that it's very similar to what we're trying to do in our classrooms. And so this was from 1938. I'm wondering, from your opinion, is there anything missing? Anything we would want to add today to that quote that isn't there? Grab the mic and share, or put it in the chat, please. Yeah, I like his focus on reflection there, too. The one thing that um, maybe we don't see there is that Oh, let's just see who someone's got a hand up. Oh, Peter, go ahead. Well, no, finish your thought, and then I'll jump in. Well, I was just going to say that one of the things that we might not see there that we might add in these days um, is the ability to have a more social context. So whether that's using our technology to, in order to do that or reaching out um, beyond our classrooms, but um, we, we might add that piece in um, and make it more of an authentic experience that goes towards a, sort of an authentic audience. That, that's just my thought about what we might add today. Strangely enough, my thought is related to your thought. What a surprise. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we, we keep talking, well, we've talked for years about metacognition and metacognitive moments and what the uh, neuroeducation research is showing quite clearly now is that we need to broaden the conversation from uh, simply metacognition, which tends to rely just on the cognitive, but to deal with context, to deal with passion, to be, deal with emotion, because it's quite clear uh, from the research now that, and we've seen it, uh, we usually see it in the negative, we usually see that uh, when kids are emotionally distraught they can't learn, but what we don't do as well, I don't think, is um, articulate and recognize that uh, emotion and passion for something uh, really changes the cognitive process that uh, one the way one engages with uh, the material or the learning. Um, I didn't say that very well, but I think you catch the drift in my meaning. So, um, so, and you know, um, Marlene Scardamilli and Carl Breiter call that intentional learning, which is a term I really like. So, intentional learning sort of takes metacognition and the social and affective components of an individual as well. It's not a term you hear very much anymore, actually. Great, thank you. So there's some great comments in the chat about other things we might add, like sharing and authentic learning and going beyond their own opinions and thoughts. So maybe adding in that critical thinking aspect about making judgments and evaluations. Very good. Awesome. So um, what we wanted to maybe start with before we looked at some of what the experts are saying is is what would be your top five elements of inquiry or your top three or if you have six, that's fine too. Um, what would be your critical components of inquiry? So we would like you to take that text tool that Louise suggested earlier. So um, I'm going to actually use the simple A as she suggested because I think it would be easier and find a space on that whiteboard and just what are the keywords? What would you, what do you think should be um, must? in terms of inquiry. So we're going to think about the element. We've, we've done a few, we've talked about a few things, but just go ahead and add what you think is important to include in an inquiry-based program.
Wow, you guys are awesome. Look at all these amazing <clears throat> elements of inquiry. Is there anything anyone would like to ask about there or comment on? Let's take a look at what people have put on there and take a minute to do that, either in the chat or grab the mic. And there's a few comments in the chat as well that aren't on the whiteboard, so check there too. Yes, Melissa, it's true. We, we see some interesting things around collaboration, also around um, locus of control. So we see agency, engagement, um, interdependence, student-centered. That's really neat. Good use of thinking tools. Sounds like someone here has been working with Garfield Jimmy Newman, <laughs> from what I see, what I see there. Um, <clears throat> Creating an environment that encourages curiosity, interest, and questioning. And I thought that what uh, Louise said in the chat was pretty powerful. She said that inquiry is, oh gosh, am I going to be able to find it quickly, Louise? Inquiry is more about what you don't know rather than what you know. And so, so it is in a little bit of conflict there um, with traditionally what we might think of as assessment because we, we are generally assessing what we know. So I thought that was really interesting. Thank you, Louise. Okay, thanks for sharing all those. So what we've got uh, lined up um, next is a, is a few common inquiry frameworks so that we can see how um, what we've suggested as common elements might compare to what others are suggesting. So this is one that often I go to the librarians, the teacher librarians, because they have such a great background in inquiry race processes. And this is basically what we would see with a common inquiry framework. So can you comment on anything you like here in the chat or with the mic? Most models of inquiry follow this this kind of a cycle are very similar to this and it's usually rather messy and recursive and iterative if it's done correctly. And I think one of our big challenges is wanting to do that cycle of inquiry and, and having that stress of time. But um, any comments? I'm going to stop talking now and let you have a chat. Karen, would you like to grab the mic and talk about the uh, the sequential nature of it or non-sequential nature? I see Karen is typing, so she may not have a mat, uh, mic today. But yes, Melissa, I would say this does, we see other forms of inquiry that we're using in this. In general, I really like the idea of tap, the, the tapping into prior knowledge and background knowledge. I think one of the things that I've learned over time is that if you don't do enough of that um, engaging background knowledge, then when you're trying to uh, get to that questioning phase, it, it's rather flat. The kids don't have enough knowledge yet to um, to ask good questions, and so. I, I used to jump in too early into that uh, problems or question stage um, without doing enough um, background. So I, I now take more time to do that. Period, would you like to comment? Just in case I can find the top uh, mic here, uh, the top button. Um, you know, just listening here and watching this slide, um, I started teaching in 71. So Peter, you're ahead of me by one year. And when I look at this, um, I was a senior science teacher and uh, did a number of science fair, fairs, ran science fairs at our school, 
and involved our students in district, uh, national, and international fairs. And uh, when I look at this, it's just the scientific method, um, which we used consistently in the science classroom. And it certainly engaged. Now, you know, it, it can, um, science fairs might give people um, cringe at the thought of doing a science fair. However, uh, if you do allow the kids the freedom um, to really um, investigate, look at that prior knowledge, and come up with uh, um, good questions, um, it brought out the best in students um, that normally wouldn't have gotten engaged. So it certainly is an opportunity to engage students who normally would be in the background. So I have a question. When it says tap into prior knowledge, background knowledge, uh, I think we are inferring that um, it means tap into prior knowledge within that student's mind, right? Bring out their inert knowledge. Whereas in other situations, let's say on a more on a grander scale might be a way of saying it, I don't know. One scientist, for example, would tap into the prior knowledge that exists in the whole world or background knowledge that exists almost like a writ, lit review and then moves ahead, right? So this is almost like a microcosm of, of a larger scene. Um, I don't know what my point is, but it just dawned on me that uh, we were inferring that, and I, I was thinking of prior knowledge in that student's mind, right? Getting them to think about what they already know about the topic, that kind of stuff, not what is known about the topic. I think they also have to, this is where uh, they would do research in my mind. Uh, go, uh, look at, start with their own knowledge, but then certainly uh, this is the biggest part of the research that they'd have to do before they could generate the questions. It's and actually, now that I'm thinking about it, it's actually a very critical situation uh, point because uh, if we're, if we aren't having kids like we want them to do authentic work, right? I'm sure that's on one of these slides here somewhere for sure, uh, having them do authentic work uh, because a lot of the work that we have them do with inquiry or whatever is really contrived. Uh, we already know the answers and that kind of thing. So it's, it's kind of a neat balance, uh, I think, to try and get going in your class. I think it's... For me, it is part of engaging that individual student, but I agree with what Louise R. is saying that, um, and I think this is what she's saying, and I might be inferring this, but uh, um, it, I think it can be something that you do as a class too. So you're building knowledge together, um, or you might be observing and noticing, and just by other students articulating what they're noticing when you're looking at resources or uh, and I'm, my experience is mostly in primary as well, so we do a lot of guided observation and that kind of thing. Um, it, it is, I think, what you what you sometimes want to do is bring everybody to a certain level of prior knowledge too. Would you agree, Peter? Like it's that knowledge building piece right at the beginning. I'm really going to have to think about this because, um, on some level, it doesn't really matter uh, in the sense that. You know, sometimes you just want to get that kid, you know, generating the um, the ambience, the knowledge that they have, the excitement, the questions. You know, you know that sometimes that's just enough. You know, they don't have to know all the world's knowledge on the topic to do, you know, to do a, a new inquiry. Um, and and to get everybody on the same, uh, up to the same level playing field for understanding uh, before you move forward, I, I don't, that's probably not possible. Um, I'm going to have to yeah. think about this, it's really quite complex. So I, I think of that word provocation that the Regio people are using, which I love. So when you mentioned bringing that frog into class, um, that's the word they're using for like that, that tapping in to um, background knowledge. So I guess when I see those two, the first two elements on the right-hand side, um, 
I could see that those might, like we said, not be linear. You might be, there might be a jumping back and forward before, um, you know, we, ha we, we have a frog. Okay, what do some people know about a frog? Oh, I know this, I know that. Okay, but, but what about this? And then a lot of us have to go and find some information. And we might do that for a while before we even uh, um, come up with our big questions. So um, it's, maybe that's a bit of where it's a recursive process too. I don't think you can ever bring everybody up to the same playing field. I'm just, I'm just remembering last year helping a, a teacher starting with this and it was about space. And they started with a KWL chart and hardly anyone in the class had any knowledge about space. So the questions were so, mm, well, they, they really had very few questions. They, they just didn't even have enough information to, to start with, with good questions. So um, they needed to, to work together to get information. And it didn't have to be everybody learning the same thing, but they had to get some information together as a class in order to be able to move forward. Let's move on, and I'm sorry Kaylee's barking in the background here, but hopefully that'll go away shortly. Here's another framework. Um, actually, this one wouldn't be in a full inquiry cycle, but this is from the Adolescent Literacy Guide that's been recently put out by the, at the ministry. And I think what, I, what I'd love to see is the, um, the connections there between what we're trying to do with inquiry around questioning and, and um, expressing and thinking strategies and reflection and what we see as important for the adolescent learner. And if you haven't had a chance to look at the document, even if you're not teaching adolescents, if you're teaching junior or younger, I would suggest you get it. It's really a good document. The best page, I think, the one I loved is page 11, talks about a learning environment. And I think these are the key things. That there's about five key things that they talk about that relate so well in my mind to inquiry, and that is affirmation. So kids feeling safe, accepted, acknowledged, and listened to. Challenge. So kids feeling like they're doing important work, that they're contributing. That's the third one. That they have power and autonomy over some of the decisions around their own learning, and that they have purpose. So I feel that those things fit so nicely in what we're talking about in inquiry. Um, just wanted to bring that up quickly. The next one is. Um, and maybe if, uh, if Louise wouldn't mind popping those links in the chat, we're not going to go to those sites today, but you might want to keep this for later. This is an inquiry, school, uh, inquiry framework created by inquiryschools.net. So have a look at that one and see what you think. And we're going to... Brenda, Julie's asked a question there yeah. about uh, peer pressure in teams. Is that mentioned in, in the stuff you've been looking at? I don't think directly, Julie, although there is a whole piece on voice and identity. And I can't see who has just, okay. You go ahead, Julie. Grab the mic. It's just I'm wondering because I find that when they're taking risk in an inquiry process and they're collaborating, the risk of being wrong um, is, is seen as something worse when they're reaching that teenage where peer pressure is present than in elementary where um, you know that 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 uh, perception of themselves is not as strong. Do you know what I mean? Because sometimes they don't want to take risks because they, they feel like if they're wrong and then there's those comments, uh, uh, you know, we, which we don't hear in elementary but we do hear in our high school classes or so, Those looking yeah. that they're scared of getting. Yeah. Brenda, that is can you so talk true. About the arts experiences. Yeah, yeah well, I, I teach, um, Sorry. It's just I teach core classes, and then they really engage when I'm giving them choice or inquiry. Um, but then they have that when they need to show or they need to ask questions. They don't want to look dumb because they ask that question. You know, like well. Do you think everybody knows except them? All of that is going on because they're so self, uh, their self-image is way more important than anything else in the world. You know what I mean? Right, right. They're delicate, right, at that age yes. around self-image. 
I, I think this is a really good point, and I think there's a whole section in this guide around um, voice and identity, and and the importance of having a safe place where you're going to be able to, you know, ask questions and and not feel uh, or take risks and and feel okay with that. Um, I know that uh, one of the things, and what Peter mentioned there is about. Uh, the arts teachers, you know, my, my husband teaches high school drama and honestly, I just, there's so much we can learn about how to do um, collaboration and, and inquiry in other subject areas well by looking at what those arts teachers do. Because he is, is often in open classes, so he's dealing with all kinds of learners and yet they have to be in such a space where they'll they'll take risks and perform in front of others and he just builds that safe space so well. So I'm always asking him, you know, what is his what are his strategies that are in that arts classroom that, that I could use other places. Um, you know, even even today I was listening I'm working with this group and they're they're gonna go out and um, tell stories with seniors. So these these kids go to um, yeah art, tech and gym. You're right, Jacqueline. Like there, there's some expertise in those teachers around building that community of learners that's very safe, and uh, we can learn lots from those folks. But these these teachers are taking grade threes and fours, a grade three four split class, and a grade seven class, and they're going to a senior center, and it's called Grand Pals, and they're um, they're learning about um, the elders in their community and they're learning about how to interview and ask questions and they're wondering and it's, it's a wonderful little project. But the teachers were amazed at how how different the grades three and fours are in the interview process at, from the grade sevens and I think it speaks just to what you're mentioning, Julie, that the grade sevens are a little more self-conscious and, and unsure of what to ask these older folks and the grade threes and fours at that point just charge ahead and, and aren't worried about it. So. It's a really good point that you make that we have to have a safe environment for kids when we're doing inquiry. Um, one, I'm not sure if it was Julie, but somebody in the chat mentioned what I thought was sorting out differences of understanding. I liked, I liked number four. Um, hey, Louise, you're an you're a contributor to Inquiry Blog. That's awesome. Do you have a mic? Can you tell us more about that? Oh darn, she doesn't have a mic, but she's going to put it in the chat for us. So I really liked this number four, and one of you did mention this in one of your questions um, or earlier on about inquiry, sorting out differences in understanding. And maybe that's, um, when I saw that, I thought that might be what I'm really getting at when I have my wondering question around how do I make sure everybody's learning. Part of it is that. Um, how do we go deeper with the misconceptions and that kind of thing? which can be so much fun in this process. Any comments to add on this one or anyone want to grab the mic about this cycle? I just love that blog, Inquire Within. So, okay, guest post on August 2nd. We're going to look that up. Louise was in it. That's awesome. Excellent, you're famous. Okay, what about for the little ones? So I came across this lovely little depiction of how it might look in primary. What we, we see, we wonder, we explore, we discover, we share, we reflect, we act, or we change. I just thought that was lovely. Okay. So Peter, would you like to talk to us a little bit about PBL? Some of you may have seen this before because um, we kind of have a favorite kind of inquiry, and that's project-based learning. But um, and I notice all my bullets have virtually disappeared on these slides. They're very, very faint. So um, yes, you'll be able to have the slides afterwards, Melissa. So why don't you take the mic and lead us through quickly the PBL section, Peter? All righty. Uh, so there's a lot of talk about project-based learning uh, these days. I mean, there there has been for quite a while. But now it seems to be uh, picking up steam in the States, it certainly is, and uh, here as well, although we tend to do things somewhat differently uh, here. 
Um, so this is from the Buck Institute, and they're quite well known uh, in the project-based learning world. So we've got four slides here and just different definitions, really, of PBL uh, from these organizations. But you'll see the similarities. I'm not going to dwell on them. Um, but largely, it talks about you know, focusing on you know, making sure you're dealing with the big, the big concepts. And that was mentioned in the chat earlier. Um, involving students, so a student-based approach. Uh, some autonomous work, knowledge construction comes up here, and that it, it should result in some sort of realistic uh, product. And I know Brenda's going to mention Seymour Papert uh, in a few minutes, so that will relate to that. Um, so that's the Buck Institute. And then George Lucas um, Educational Foundation, used to be called, called GLEF, now it's Edutopia. Um, again, you'll see the similarities. It's curriculum fueled. Um, they throw in standards based. Um, Talking about questioning again, um, although it looks there very much like uh, the teachers generating the question. Um, real world problems, so dealing with that issue of authenticity. And um, this one I like at the end a method that fosters abstract intellectual tasks to explore complex issues. That's sort of a unique statement out of the bunch of them. Linda Darling Hammond, uh, a US educator of note. Um, Again, you'll see similar kinds of things. Curricular, driving questions, constructive investigation, uh, student agency, um, and authenticity, once again. And then the last one, and this is the only one that mentions technology, because these are the only people of that class, well, not fair to say, but the others you know, aren't focused in the technology ed, ed tech space as much as Susie and Jane are. Um, but again, curriculum. Uh, not an add-on, uh, just built in as part of the deal. Um, authentic, collaborative, and then uh, technology integrated as a tool for you know discovery, collaboration, and uh, doing things that you couldn't otherwise do. Um, and we've seen some of that. Any of you who watched and followed Chris Hadfield and so forth, and lots of other things over the past years uh, with those simulations. Um, you know, it's been pretty awesome that you can get out and do those kinds of things. And I shared a, a video with uh, Jacqueline and Brenda, a TED Talk. And maybe we'll you know, find that while, uh, while we move ahead that relates with how technology is enhancing the lives of many folks who, who can't get out of their houses anymore for various physical reasons. So, so that's uh, project-based learning. And again, uh, the danger is that people uh, around the world tend to be grabbing onto this construct and uh, and using checklists and managing things and micromanaging things in order to get through their PBL. Okay, kids, you got your question done. Where's your question? You got your question done. You know, it just like becomes a little insane when you look at some of the stuff that that gets done, rather than again a way of being, a way of thinking about the world and and integrating these concepts into into that lively, loving, you know, environment. And Brenda, you want to talk about Seymour? Sure. I just wanted to make one last comment around PBL. I, the reason I love it is um, because, like you guys were saying in the discussion, it, it, it's curriculum based. I can take big ideas and work backwards from there. I don't feel like um, I'm not getting my job done as a teacher when I'm when I'm doing it. And the Buck Institute and Edutopia were two places that I started. Um, Buck Institute has all kinds of planning sheets and mapping, you know, unit mapping um, sam resources for teachers. And I'm a, kind, I'm a planner. I am so okay with deviating from the plan, but I really like to have a framework first to start from. So that suited me really well. And once I was comfortable with, uh, you know, how things were going to go, because actually what I found was we, we actually went beyond a lot of the curriculum expectations in some areas, so that was really exciting, um, then I was okay. So Seymour Packard and Hard Fun, um, and I think Peter might have mentioned Logo when he first did his introduction or his story about how he got started with inquiry, but I have really um, gotten a lot of influence from, from Seymour Packard, and oh, Julie has no audio. Can you guys hear me okay? I can hear you fine. Okay, it's come back for you, Julie. Good. Okay. Um, 
It, this, a funny story is when I was starting to take some courses at OISE and starting to learn about some of these big thinkers, Seymour Popper was one that I so, totally fell in love with. And I, and I remember talking to Peter at some event and saying, oh, I heard about this guy you would just love, <laughs> Seymour Papert. And I remember him saying, oh, yeah, I know Seymour Papert. And he laughed. And um, actually, that's the story of my life with Peter because he, he knows everybody. So it was just one thing after another. Do you remember that, Peter? When that happened, he does. <laughs> so um, anyway, Seymour Papert studied under Jean Piaget. So he was a mathematician, created a software program called Logo, the Little Turtle, for, for kids. But he also took uh, what he learned about constructivism from Piaget, and he created his, uh, his own kind of learning, I don't know if you'd call it a theory, but he created something called constructionism. And so he said that kids, or anyone actually, when we create some type of artifact, it allows us to talk with others about our learning. And um, it becomes explicit to the world kind of thing. And I just loved this idea that that's a lot of what we're trying to do in project-based learning especially, but in other kinds of inquiry, is trying to get kids to articulate what they're learning, create an artifact to share with a learning community. And then in doing that sharing, that's when we can learn more about each, about each other's thinking. So the three big ideas I take away from this guy's work, and Melissa, if you're doing coding at your board, you really have to check out Papert's work. But he says kids like hard fun. You know, they like a challenge. They like to know that they're doing important work. And I think we're learning this from, from when we hear about game-based learning. We're, knowing, we're learning that kids do indeed like to be challenged. They don't mind not being successful, they, they can be driven to actually keep at it until they get something. And that's what we're learning from, from the game, gamers. Um, you, we know that being at the edge of your zone of proximal development, like being on your edge and being pushed forward is where we like to be, where we feel good as learners. So um, it's okay not to know all the answers. Um, we want to nurture that urge to know. The second thing is he tells a story about um, if he wanted to be a, become a carpenter, and he says if he wanted to, if he wants to become a carpenter, what he would do is um, he would learn he would find a carpenter and he would hang out with a carpenter and watch what that person did and tried some things and get some help with them. So Seymour says that we kids need to see us learning that that we put children in a room and we give them an expert learner. The teacher is in there with them. But we very rarely, the teacher, very rarely the kids get to see the teacher actually learning something new. We already know the curriculum. So it's not going to be a surprise for us. And he, he would suggest we need more surprises so that kids can be actually seeing us learning. And so inquiry does that for me. And the other thing is that kids can think like a mathematician or a scientist or an artist. And we, we, should, we should let them experience what those dispositions are all about. And I think this is where our social studies new curriculum is going. Um, so I was thrilled to see that, that that idea of dispositional thinking is coming out. And, and he, he sort of was the first person that, that made me think that way. I also think the arts teachers do that really well. You know, when you go into a, an art, a visual art class, you become a painter. When you go into my husband's drama class, you're an actor. And what we need to do is have, when you go into math class, you're a mathematician or a scientist that would be, um, that engage that passion in the, in the discipline. Okay, so um, what we'd like to do here, and I'm just looking at the time, I think we're good. Who's we got? Hands up. Can I just interject for a second, Brenda? Sure. Uh, Louise just asked a question, or Carol asked a question, is Minecraft a good option when using computers in school? Um, I mean, I think Seymour's answer to that uh, would be, it's not really an issue of whether it's Minecraft that's important. For him, it was gears. Uh, Seymour was fascinated with gears as a child. That's why he invented, uh, and, and he was a tinker with the gears, and he and ended up inventing logo and then inventing Lego logo, which was a precursor to Lego Mindstorms, 
uh, what some of you may know, sort of the robotics things. So for him, it was the fact that you, he fell in love with gears. Um, and that's what uh, drove his learning. So I would suggest that if kids are falling in love with something like mine, uh, Minecraft and the teacher is enthusiastic about it, then those kids, then you're going to find the ways to, to make it relevant for the classroom learning. Uh, it could be you fall in love with whatever. So I don't think it's, it's that particular tool that's the deal. It's the love. God, I sound like a hippie. <laughs> well, and, and, you know, what I think is unfortunate is Minecraft is sort of the accessible one and it's the free one. And so while I think there's lots of advantages to it, there are other tools that would allow students, even grade ones, because I was using Microworlds Junior with grade ones, which is very similar to Turtle Art. Okay, so there's a free version of, of um, Logo. And kids were using it pre-reading. They didn't need to know how to read in order to program procedures and sub-procedures and create mazes and it was just amazing. So they don't get that piece, I don't think, in, in Minecraft. They get the idea of building something, but um, maybe not from a programming language unless they're working on their own servers and all of that kind of stuff. So, yeah, you could, I know that the people that I, um, that I know, if you want to to Google Liam O'Donnell, um, he'd be one person uh, that would give you some information on using Minecraft in the classroom. He uses it more as a catalyst to engage kids in other kinds of learning. So, um, and you know what, that's Julie, um, Liam would so in, agree with what you just said there. He, say, he would say we can't, um, you know, if we run the danger of overschooling things, because the reason kids are in Minecraft, of course, is because it isn't school. It's it's their freedom to learn what they want to do. So, um, you know, it's it's tricky. That's for sure. So, what I'd like to do is spend a few minutes here, and I'm I'm conscious of the time, thinking about disciplinary thinking. So, what do you think? inquiry would look like or what would be hmm, particular about inquiry in science, inquiry in math, I just picked these four, language arts and social studies. And I did some research on this and Peter and I have some slides following this, but we just wanted to sort of um, get your thoughts and just pick one of the subjects that interests you and then think about what would inquiry in that subject need to look like. Is it different than in other subjects? And I'm going to turn off my mic and let you do that for a couple minutes. So can you expand a little bit on that, Louise? When you say historical thinking, um, what, what do you, can you unpack that a little bit in the chat? What are you meaning? And Jacqueline, it is, uh, it, science is kind of easy. It is inquiry. So what is, what do you think, in, how do you think science inquiry might be different than social studies? Okay, thank you guys for putting those, unpacking that a bit. So in, and now uh, some of our folks may not have gotten into the, the big six yet, Louise, but what you're talking about is significance, cause and consequence, continuity and change, patterns and trends, interrelationships and perspective, those six, the six umbrella topics that are, um, that the, the new curriculum is, is all about in all of the areas, right? And they want to see, when Jacqueline mentions, they want to see what's going to happen in science, right? Okay. So um, what we did was we did a little bit of, um, we're just going to go through these and have you, let you have a look at these. We did a little bit of research in, in looking at um, what folks in the particular disciplines think that inquiry looks like for their domain. So let's have a look at science here. And just... Um, 
I invite you to just add some comments in the chat or grab the mic if there's something you see that you disagree with or strongly agree with or make a connection to, so please do that. So there's science. So when, <clears throat> when I was looking at your comment there, Jacqueline, figuring out what's going to happen, it's kind of like drawing a conclusion about a truth, finding, finding a truth. And of course, Peter, you would say, I can almost hear you typing in that our truth there I typed it. might be, <laughs> yes, okay, you were typing it while I was, I couldn't see you typing it, so that was me just, li I was reading your mind. Um, what we, do you want to expand on that? Go ahead. I do, actually, um, briefly. Um, you know, scientists are always seeking truth, but a sci good scientists will tell you that they don't find the truth, they find approximations to truth. Because let's face it, uh, over, the, over the centuries, we have had many truths that are really temporary. The Earth is flat. The sun revolves around the Earth. You know, uh, you know various, various truths like that. We can't control your autonomic nervous system. Uh, well, you can practice meditation and get at it, you know. So uh, so we're always seeking you know, approximations, I believe. So Syria, as a scientist, I'm sure you would give the thumbs up to Peter for that. Science yes, I agree. Yeah. It's Science the truth science. at the time based on the knowledge that people have at the time. It, it appears to be the truth. And then as uh, we get more information. Um, we look at the atomic theory and where we are today and where it was in the early um, 1900s. So, yes, approximations of the truth. Very cool. Very cool. And I like what Jack says about giving the kids the challenge of proving them wrong over their years in science. That's neat. Okay, let's look at uh, math. Okay, here's what the experts we looked into say that inquiry looks like in math. That's and point of view. any other comments on that one? I'd have to unpack that point of view thing because if I think of mathematics, I think about 